Okay, so it's two o'clock. So in Barcelona time, Milan time. So let's start. Thank you, all of us. I see networkers and maybe potential networkers are in today. And we have the honor to have to this uh, crash course with Simone Cicero, right? <laughs> and we are going to discover how to use the platform design toolkit, right? And he's going to uh, show us and we'll have the good clues, right? In order to, to build this networker business model. So Simone, thank you so much to being with us. Welcome again to the network and please, you, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm also happy to see some known faces. Uh, some of, uh, some of uh, you also attended uh, some of our trainings. Others have been, uh, you know, actually running workshop directly in terms of advisory with us. So I am, I'm so happy to see you here. Uh, all the all the known faces and uh, and uh, well today you know what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a more like a, a kind of a compassing uh, uh, there's some noise in the background so maybe we can mute yes I'm everybody. going to mute everybody yeah <laughs> maybe there there is a, a okay that's it so I'm going to give you uh, more um, kind of a compassing uh, session and answer questions because you know PDT platform design toolkit is a bit it's a big thing so there's a lot to do there's a lot you can do so actually doing a kind of a training like experience is gonna be too hard for one hour uh, one hour and a half or whatever we have today uh, so it's gonna be much more like uh, helping you to figure out where you can find your uh, the right information what are the faces you can approach uh, how the pieces connect together, how can you support organizationally speaking these uh, practices, um, the outcomes of each phase and how they connect and so on. So uh, it's going to be more, much more about navigating the complexity of our methodology that is even growing uh, um, instead of just going deep into the, the methodology itself. But of course, I'm happy to... Uh, catch any any question. Uh, I'm really looking forward to always to engage with adopters. I mean, you know, the, this is the most interesting thing always for me to listen to people and how they're using the tools, how they're you know cracking it and hacking it. And, and I must say, we are now also structuring our organization a bit more this year. Um, and part of the work I want to do this year is to um, you know create ways for the community to not just get the methodology but also integrate and fork and and translate for example i get so many uh, people in the world that uh, that want to translate the methodology and it's even complicated to do that uh, so far so we we really have work to do in terms of getting this communication between us and the community much more bi-directional and this is going to happen this year uh with coming up so many pieces of research i'm going to share with you later on so i'm sure that we will have time to to do that so let me just go through a quick presentation where i first i will tell you a little bit more about boundaryless uh just for a few minutes and then we're going to dive deep into the faces and the artifacts how can you use that and so on. and by the way this is the new brand of boundaryless if you if you are not familiar with that uh, uh, check out our new website. Uh, most of you, I think, uh, have been um, following us on platformdesigntoolkit.com, but uh, since uh, one month, more or less, uh, and uh, um, we had uh, this new website online, uh, www.boundaryless.io, uh, and the old one is going to be deactivated soon, so we're going to redirect you on new website. So it's also important that you familiarize with that, and I will try also to help you to figure out the new website. So Boundaryless mission is really about enabling everyone to participate in this crazy future of organizing. And when I talk about organizing, I'm talking about not just business models. I'm talking about organizational models. I'm talking about uh, economic spaces. You know, we are doing research on Web3 as well. So it's really about, you know, these new possibilities, how to engage with that. Uh, and this is our mission to help you do that. 
because basically we believe that the future is going to be about us, not about the center. No, it's not going to happen that someone comes up and say, you know, this is the future of organizing. Take it and use it. No, we're going to we're going to do it together. No, everybody's doing it, so we have to do that, and we have to enable you to do it. Uh, Boundaryless runs workshops and consulting services, large scale innovation programs, for example, ad hoc uh, integration of design frameworks in, with big companies and so on, uh, institutions. Uh, and uh, um, and uh, we do it basically with this approach that puts together the firm and the, and the business model. So it's, it's really about you know, the market and the firm recognizing that there is no more this difference, this gap between the two, there's no more boundary in the firm. So we have to integrate that in a unified theory. Uh, so we do it at the moment with two main frameworks. Uh, one is the very well-known platform design toolkit that we're gonna talk about today. And the other one is uh, what we call the entrepreneurial ecosystem enabling organization toolkit, uh, 3EO, uh, because it's 3E and O. And uh, uh, the 3O toolkit is, uh, you know, basically about how do you organize internally as an organization or most, most specifically as an ecosystemic organization in a way that you can really engage the market. You know that uh, uh, Conway Law uh, tells us since the end of the 60s, uh, you, you're not going to be able to interact with ecosystems if you are uh, you know, kind of a monolith organization. So you have to create an organization that works as a network if you really want to generate uh, network uh, impacts and business models in, in the market. Um, the PDT is 2013 born, it's 10 years in the making, uh, many, many copycats, uh, you know, we're basically inspiring a whole new design practice. So many projects coming in and saying, you know, trying their stabbing the problem on their own way. And we're really happy to see sometimes they attribute uh, the inspiration we gave them. So, but sometimes they did, they don't, but it's fine. Uh, it's important thing is we engage with this, you know, and uh, we, we are happy that uh, we have been able to work with so many players uh, uh, so far uh, with this. Trio Toolkit was born in 2019 and now it's the second year. We're going to release a massive new update uh, this year and it's going to be about an adoption guide as well. So you, you're going to learn how as an organization. Sorry. There is some music in the background. Uh, as an organization, how do you approach the problem? So it's not just about the, the canvases, it will be a, a full adoption guide for you to engage uh, with your small or big organization. For example, Boundaryless at the moment is fully transitioning towards trio model. I wanna share more how we're doing it. So you're gonna get some inspirations. Uh, happy to help if, if you like. Coming back to the, to the PDT, the PDT is really about moving away from pipelines to platforms. So it's about recognizing that technology empowers the edges. Uh, we have lower transaction costs. The firm is being transformed. Business models are being transformed. And so it's going to be about much more about how do we facilitate interaction as an organization versus you know, controlling production that we used to in, in the industrial age. Um, you, you, you see my slide, right? Am I OK? I was you know, afraid I was talking to uh, no. nothing. <laughs> and they, there are two pillars at, the, at what, in our understanding, what a platform, a platform strategy is. And it's always about one transactional element. So it's about you know, facilitating transactions, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, reducing further the transaction cost that is you know, re being reduced by technology, but intentionally reducing transaction costs, creating better channels, uh, creating templates, you know, facilitating interactions. Um, and, you know, that's one part that normally we recognize as, for example, the marketplace or what uh, we increasingly call the extension platform. So marketplaces that connect application developers, for example, with customers or template developers and so on. So service marketplaces, app marketplaces, this is normally the, what we call the transactional element. And then on the other side, you have the uh, what we call the learning engine. So this is all about transforming the idea that an organization is about controlling production into an organization that is responsible to uh, supporting continuous improvement in the ecosystem. So essentially, everybody now is in the learning business. No? So our organizations need to foster improvement, continuous transformation, and learning. And this is what we call the learning engine. So at the end of the day, uh, what do we do? 
we accompany uh, designers on their own or companies or organizations through this, normally these five stages. Uh, the first one is much more about understanding the potential. And then there is the exploration phase uh, that relates with, uh, we will see more in, in a minute, understanding the ecosystem, value chains, and so on. And then it follows by, uh, it's followed by the proper design sessions, the design phase where you actually try to articulate what you wanna bring as, a, as an operator to the market. And we call it experiences that you bring to the market, platform experiences. And then you have validation and growth. Uh, validation you will be familiar with. We're gonna spend some words on it in a minute, but it's about you know basically avoiding spending money on ideas that are not really resonating with the, with the reality and growth uh, that is a massive new field that uh, we have been researching a lot, especially lately. And you can find already so many resources about, it's about uh, essentially connecting your, the customers to the product at scale, right? So I, I sometimes uh, I recall this amazing uh, uh, interview that, uh, uh, that I was uh, listening to, to the first CMO at Shopify, I don't remember the name, uh, uh, but essentially he said, you know, my work, my my job was about connecting the customer to the fantastic product we had. And this is growth, essentially. This is how you grow a platform business. Um, so the, the PDT is essentially a, a language for co-creation. It's something that helps you to, uh, first of all, take a team and speed up the team to, uh, you know, bringing the team to the market, essentially, because we are so used to teams kind of jiggling and, and you know, wrangling with ideas for months without actually getting into something that they can validate. And it's also about, uh, you know, basically co-designing something and suddenly uh, transition from, I say something, you say something different into we are building a model together and this is what we build. And so it's not, uh, it's not anymore about me and you, what you think and what I think, it's about what we think as a team and uh, you know, this brings us to the market faster. And this is essentially what PDT is all about. Almost a thousand, a hundred thousand downloads uh, so far and adopters, uh, more than a thousand trained participants. Uh, in February the 3rd, we're gonna have our bootcamp uh, uh, starting. So I really encourage you, if you want to go deep into this, take the chance to join our boot camps. Uh, there's a, some special discounts for the people at the network, uh, for the associates, for the members of the network. Uh, and it's a six uh, sessions online, 24 hours training. Uh, and this is how you get certified so, so that you can use it with your customers. Uh, you know, not that you cannot because it's open source, but if you want to do it uh, on a more solid basis, we really encourage you to do so. Uh, Understanding how platform design toolkit works. Now I will try to go straight to the point. So if you don't understand something I'm saying, just raise your hand. I'm gonna stop. If you have more, you know, more comments or larger questions, uh, I encourage you to maybe wait to the end of the presentation. This is gonna be probably something like 20 minutes, not so long. Uh, and then we can engage, uh, you know, maybe 25 or something like that, so that we still have an ample time to you know, ask questions and, and understand better uh, So if you have outstanding questions. But in any case, if you don't get something I'm saying, feel free to stop me, raise your hand digitally or, or in, in video, and I will uh, uh, you know, get you to, to ask your question. So this presentation is about understanding how the PDT can be useful, uh, what you can achieve with this methodology. So as I said uh, at the start, uh, we're talking about four phases, uh, you know, mainly four phases in the platform design process. Uh, there is the exploration phase, the strategy design phase, validation and prototyping, and growth. If you click on, or if you, you know, write up uh, blss.io slash pdt, you will land on the page. You will actually land on this page. I'm gonna show you a little bit around because it's important, this is a new website, so, you have to find out uh, all, all you're looking for. So in our new website, there is a page called uh, uh, Platform Design that explains you the approach. And then at the resources and toolkit link, you can actually find uh, the, all the tools. So the direct download links and uh, the links to understand more. The PDT uh, uh, and both the opportunity exploration and the strategy design elements 
and the trio. So coming back to uh, the uh, Cloud Foundry Design, uh, the framework page, if you scroll a little bit, you can also find the link to the toolkit at the middle of the page. So if you click here, there is a plan for the design toolkit page. And here you can find all the frameworks. So uh, as you can see, there is phase one and two, awareness and exploration, platform opportunity exploration guide. This is going to be about scanning the ecosystem and capturing the value chain. Then you have the plan for design, uh, strategy elements. So this is what you need for the design of the experience. Uh, and you can download it directly. This is the historic PDT, right? The, the things that are about the business model, the interactions and so on. And then there is the link to the resources on validation and the link to the um, resources on growth. Okay, so you can find everything on this page. So let me come back to the presentation. Let's see if I can do that uh, quickly. So I have these two, um, uh, two, okay. So it should be here. So this is a, just to give you an idea of where to find stuff on the website. Uh, four phases, as I said, let's try, let's start by identifying what do you have? So what are the things you have, you can use? First of all, uh, and of course the license, the license is Creative Commons, share like uh, attribution. So it's commercial friendly. Many people ask me, what, I can, what can I do with the PDT? And the answer is anything you want. You just need to attribute it if you publish some derivative works. And this is also information you can find on our about page on the website. But if you use it for commercial reasons, you know, there's tons of corporations that have been using it and integrating it uh, sometimes without attributing, unfortunately. But if you do it properly, you can do anything you want. It's commercial friendly, it's real open source. And there is no forms, you know, you just download it. You don't need to leave any name or whatever. So exploration guide, strategy design guide, which, which is the one that normally we call the user guide because it's, it's the original document that we released in 2013, uh, or actually 16. And then you have validation and prototyping and growth. These things are coming up. So they are coming up in the form of a guide, but especially for the growth, and I will show you a little bit more, there's a lot that you can already use. Hmm? Not the guide, but the guide I'm working on with the, with the team and it's gonna be out probably Q1 as well. Uh, Q1, you know, growth should be out in Q1. Probably validation is uh, Q1 or Q2. It may be an addendum to the growth, but essentially these things are coming up. Uh, so as I said, the, the growth guide is coming up. Uh, it's important that you understand that uh, on the, on our, if you look at our blog in the, webs, in the website, you can find this blog called the research a recap from our research on platform growth, where you can find all the links and you, you will find uh, links to six research posts that cover all these elements, flywheels, growth engines, monetization schemas, pricing, uh, growth tactics uh, to achieve liquidity, metrics, and four crazy webinars with so many practitioners. I really encourage you to listen to them. One is with James Carrier, for example, our you know, the legend, and uh, many others. And this has been done with my friend Manfredi Sassoli, which is a, who is a great growth uh, practitioner from the UK, uh, doing some very important, important work. O on the validation part, there is especially one blog post from 2017 that we use it, uh, as a way to exchange basically with our community, how we were thinking about customer development that you may be familiar with. Customer development from Steve Blank is the approach to product validation. So basically the idea is don't waste your time in products that do not sell or they don't solve any problem for the customer. We did the same, but essentially we took it and reinterpreted a little bit for the age of ecosystems and for multi-sided pay propositions. There's still work to do, but you already have some content here that you can use that helps you to run interviews, for example, in, in a way that is much proper, uh, much more proper for platforms. But anyway, anyways, the guide is coming up, more work is coming up on validation uh, and uh, we hope to release it uh, soon. This is what you can use at the moment. So let's go back to the start, exploration. What is exploration about? Exploration is about essentially understanding your ecosystem, hmm? abstracting 
uh, the value chain and assessing the opportunity. So it's something that happens before the design phase. When we speak about exploration, essentially we speak about arenas of opportunities. It's really about understanding what the ecosystem is trying to achieve in a way that is uh, fragmented. So at the moment, you can think of, for example, the ecosystem around uh, uh, you know, food, for example, or the ecosystem around mobility or whatever. And also you, 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 the methodology helps you to figure out essentially what is happening, understanding the value chain and uh, preparing the design phase. And I'm gonna go in, in a deeper uh, you know, details in a minute. The char characteristics of this phase is uh, that this phase is very much outside in. So it's not about your ideas. You, you really have to avoid projecting your ideas uh, into the work at this moment. You, know, you really have to capture what is happening. And so in terms of product thinking, you can think of avoiding thinking about the solution before thinking about the problem. So you want to avoid thinking about the platform strategy before thinking about the ecosystem. So this, that's essential, right? Uh, and normally it's really about a small team, an internal team in the organization, uh, relatively small investment. Normally we take 16 to 20 hours, something like, something like that. And it definitely needs domain expertise. Of course, because if you do not know about the ecosystem, what are you modeling? What are you, what are you going, to, going to map? What are you going to scan? You have to have the domain expert in the room. And this can be done uh, either by um, interviewing domain experts, maybe first and then mapping, or maybe coming back to them after the map, or I would say also having them in the room because uh, the methodology is very intuitive. You know, it's not that rocket science. So anybody can really participate in these uh, co-creative sessions where you map all the elements that exist. In, in terms of organizational enablement, uh, you know, for example, if you are an organizational leader, what are you supposed to put in for this phase to happen uh, in the right way? First of all, you need to allocate team time. So you don't expect people to do proper exploration if they do not spend time on it. Yeah, they have to map, they have to scan, they have to interview domain experts. So they need to have time allocated to that. Hmm? And then after the exploration, maybe you want to have some, you know, as a leader, for example, in an organization, you want to say, I want to evaluate these opportunities. So let's see what do we pursue first. And this may deal with, for example, the total addressable market or what assets do you have as an organization in that space and so on. And sometimes it's also very important to, to evaluate the implication for the portfolio products that you have. So for example, one of the assets involved may be a user base that you have for another product, okay? So really as a leader, this is what normally you have to do if you are in a big organization, I would say. If you are in a small startup team, there is no big leader. Everybody needs to be about you know, mapping, 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 understanding what's going on. How do we do that? We do essentially through these two main tools. One is the ecosystem scan and one is a value chain map. Ecosystem scan is essentially just a way to have a, a you know, basically a, a little structure on a canvas that you can use to map interactions that are happening in the ecosystem in a way that uh, it's already conducive to looking at things from a platform perspective. So, I'm not gonna go into deep details because you have guides for this. There is a you know, kind of a 60 page that you can download and use, but which has been already updated in April. So it's fairly recent and I'm gonna update soon with more tools for arena scanning and so on. I'm not gonna go into details, but essentially tools that help you to identify even better the scope. But once you have identified the scope, what you need to do, you have to map what is happening. You have to scan what is happening. And, what we suggest is to do it in a way that is not so deep. It's fairly easy. Three layers, you map the interactions in the niche elements, in the producers and consumers that are exchanging value. You map all the players that are mediating the relationships, and then you map all the resources that people are using. You know, for example, assets or commodities, utilities, consumables, whatever. 
So this is the scanning phase, you know, the ecosystem scan. And, and like, can yeah, I, go ahead. yes. So in, in this one, when you see this ecosystem scan, it's just from your idea, right? Is you are getting your idea, you're getting your marketplace and you do the ecosystem of your idea. So all the stakeholders. You, you don't actually map your ideas, you map what, you have, what is happening in the ecosystem. So okay. assume that there is no marketplace yet, a marketplace is just a way to organize an experience. Mm -hmm. So there is no experience yet made by a platform. Essentially, there can be sometimes you know, existing platforms, but what, we, what you are supposed to map here is what is happening in the ecosystem. So for example, if you look at the example here, I don't know if it's enough uh, to see that, but essentially here we have a map of uh, uh, the space around uh, um, installing solar panel uh, on top of your rooftop. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you have? You have uh, uh, some kind of systemic interaction around uh, choosing a, an installer. So let's say that people want to choose somebody to install solar panel on their roof. They normally go through solution providers, some advisors, maybe they go through uh, web search and so on. So you map these elements. So you actually map the, the experiences as they exist in the ecosystem in a very fragmented way. But you're not putting any idea on that. It's very, it's much, very much about mapping, scanning. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the name tells you the approach. You are scanning what is happening. This is essential because, because you, you, what we suggest is that you apply your platform thinking after a very deep understanding of the value chain and, and on also what is happening in the ecosystem first. So first of all, you want to scan and you scan through these three lenses, uh, three layers, because they are, are gonna be making it easier for you to map the value chains, right? So doing this transition from the left to the right. What, what do we use for value chain map is uh, um, is Simon Wardley's maps. Wardley maps are the best uh, value chain mapping tools existing at the moment, according to our understanding. This, they are also open source. And essentially it's a way to translate all the elements that you have been scanning on the market and moving them into a much more conscious and much more informed way are looking how pieces fit together. So for example, uh, you can say that, uh, let me make a, a simple example. To create a cup of tea, you need a cup, you need a tea shop, you need energy, you need electricity, basically, you need water, you need a kettle. And you know, Wordly Maps help you to connect all these pieces and also understanding how these pieces are evolved in terms of, are they new, are they, very much commoditized and so on. So what happens is that, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna go deep into mapping here because we don't have time. There is a 24 hours uh, bootcamp certification or a 60 pager if you, if you want to do that properly. But um, essentially what you have is normally these uh, value chains have this C shape. And this is a very particular shape that industrial value chains tend to have. And what do we have uh, applied? Uh, what we have uh, created is a library that helps you to move away from an industrial value chain into what we call a platformized value chain. So the second step of uh, uh, um, uh, essentially the opportunity exploration phase is to apply this library of patterns. So what are this, these patterns? It's what we call the platform plates. The beauty of uh, Wordly Maps is that they are visual, right? You know, you have pieces you can play with. You can do it with Post-its, you can do it with Miro and so on, Mural. And then you move pieces around according to these six rules. What are these six rules? Essentially, these six platform plays, they describe common ways that platform operators uh, have to transform the value chain. And let me, let me go into all of the six because they are fairly simple. So first of all, everybody knows that uh, when you have a marketplace, a platform, most of the times you have 
Uh, you have to provide personalized experiences. This is a winning point of platforms. So you have to basically transform a very um, commoditized experience, like something that is uh, um, common to every user into a very personal experience. So this is one thing that platforms do. It's the, essentially, it's the difference between, for example, uh, uh, booking a room on, on a hotel and booking a room on Airbnb. You know, hotel rooms are all pretty much all the same. The Airbnbs are very different. They are much more uh, scattered around the city. There is much more geographic difference and personalization you can have and so on. And the same thing, uh, and this is the platform play number one, the same thing happens on the uh, producer side. So you have to basically start looking up the producers. Instead of considering them suppliers, you want to consider them users. You want to give them an experience that makes their specificity emerge. So you want to make them able to express their uniqueness. And this is another way that marketplaces and platforms normally transform the value chain. So they transform commoditized users, uh, sorry, suppliers into niche providers, right? Unique providers. Then uh, what, what else happens often with, with marketplaces and platforms is that they uh, standardize the transactions. So, Again, let me make an example with Airbnb. Airbnb, you know, before Airbnb, booking a room on a short-term rental was like a, a nightmare. You know, it was always different. It was always complicated. You have to wire the money, phone calls, and you know, nobody, nobody really was um, having a consistent experience. With with Airbnb now, you know, you just click, money goes. To the, from the credit card to the escrow, everything is standardized, flows much better, right? So it's a standardization of the transactions. And this is a billing transaction, but it can be any transaction. And we're gonna talk about this in a minute, but essentially what you have to understand, what you have to try to understand with this value chain analysis is to identify the transactions and think of how do you standardize them? Another transaction could be signing a contract, it could be, for example, activating a solar panel in the in the in the network. Uh, you know, you know, my parents, for example, now are dealing with a with a dramatic experience of trying to plug the solar panels into the network, and crazy because they didn't do that through a platform; they do it through a service provider, and you know, it's a nightmare basically. Finally, uh, so finally, furthermore complex business process become software as a service. You know, again, let's think Airbnb. Well, how complex it was to manage your rentals. You had to receive money, manage the calendar, do the tax filing. All these things were painful, a complex business, business process, transformed into software as a service. You know, now it's everything is great, easy. Airbnb now even gives you the possibility to set your price with all this info, uh, data uh, elements. Uh, it's, it's amazing, right? So transforming a complex business process, normally this relates with the producers in your ecosystem into a software as a service. This is what we normally call the key product. Now it becomes the key product in a platform value proposition, right? In a platform value proposition, you don't adjust at the marketplace. You have the product elements, and increasingly, you have the extensions and developers that can extend this product. But think of Shopify, for example. There is a marketplace, experts and, uh, and sellers connect to shared services, but there is a key product that is the actual infrastructure to run e-shops. And this is what was transformed into a software as a service by, by Shopify. Then the last two are pretty much connected and they relate with creating a marketplace. So when you create a marketplace, normally you have to do two things and this is what platforms do. First of all, you have to, of course, aggre aggregate demand and supply. So it's not just about designing the roles for the producer and consumer, but you also have to design the experience of connecting, filtering, finding each other and so on. And create this space where everybody gets aggregated so that everybody wants to be there. And uh, finally, you have to create a, a clear, unique identities because this enables the accumulation of reputation and trust. 
so Airbnb, for example, when you when you sign in now, you have you have to go to uh, an ID check, right? You have your passport, and then you have your face, your name, your reputation is there. Uh, you accumulate reputation points, and this is important because otherwise, how do you trust someone in a marketplace? It's impossible, right? So. You don't trust the brand anymore. You trust another third party. So you have to build this reputation. You have to build these identities. And these are the six tra traditional elements of what platforms do to value chains. Some platforms don't do all of them. You know, for example, I don't know, Uber. Uh, it didn't really allow producers to be unique. Repeat number two because in that context, it wasn't really needed. And in our white paper that I'm gonna talk about more in the end of the conversation, you can find a, a, a very large treatment of uh, how these value chain elements are uh, evolving according to managed or vertical marketplaces and so on. So you can find it there, but this is the bouquet of options that you have. Of course, you don't blindly apply them. You have to think through them but this is kind of your, uh, your bouquet, your, your options that you have. So in terms of methodology, what happens? You apply this platform place to the visual uh, value chain that you created and you obtain a new value chain that to some extent represents what you want to achieve, right? It gives you the starting point to actually design the experience and how it's helpful because it gives you insight on insights on essentially, first of all, what are the roles you have to design for? So the people that you, you, you're gonna be treating as users, uh, it gives you uh, more clarity on what are the transactions that you want to standardize and what are the workflows that you want to integrate into this service uh, package uh, that normally is provided through a software as a service. But it can be even more generally a service bundle, right? Not necessarily just a SaaS, it can be SaaS plus, I don't know, for example, logistics automation. So, uh, first of all, let me just say one word about this. This is so painful, but it's less painful than doing it without this framework, right? So if you do it without this framework, then it's gonna take you forever. If you do it with this framework, it's going to take you 20 hours. Maybe you're not as good as me after 20 years in doing this, but you, I'm sure you're going to do amazing things with this. So designers and entrepreneurs, this is there for you. It's open source. You have to commit to do that with your team and change insights. It's going to be very hard. You have to maybe do it three or four times, but you know this is going to bring you so many insights. Marco. Yeah, and thank you very much for this overview. Just, just a very short question. Um, is the set shape of the platform we see on the right side kind of the platform shape of the value chain? Are we right. transforming from a C shape to a set shape? Yes. Yes, uh, normally the, the platforms, uh, you know, they have these marketplace elements on the top. So they have these uh, uh, users connected to a marketplace. They have standardized experiences, um, the software uh, package and the reputation elements, and then they have some commodities that they normally leverage on. So the, the, the short answer is yes, normally C to Z is a good heuristics, heuristic, but more generally, I must say here, it's all heuristics. So you don't have a recipe, you just have to keep these heuristics in mind and then see what happens, right? In, in trying to apply these heuristics in, into, the, into the work you're doing. So overall, yes, it's C to Z, but for example, in managed marketplaces, you can have a different shape. In vertical marketplaces, you can have another one. So overall, yes, but always with a grain of salt, right? May I have a Alex? question? Oh, I'm sorry. Marco, you are on mute. I don't know if, if you're speaking, we are not hearing you. Uh, sorry, yeah, I was muted. <laughs> um, yeah, that's exactly why I was asking because I felt that I might be generalizing way too much. Uh, yes. So. Yes, definitely. Is it possible one more question, uh, Simone? Yeah, I think Alex is uh, in, on the queue, so 
please go ahead. All right. So where is the point where we can get the specifications to pass to the IT engineers, like uh, business specifications, functional, non-functional, and constraints? Uh, I'm get, going get to get there later on. So if you're a bit patient, uh, I will, uh, maybe we can ask this question later, uh, going through the, the phase, and, and I will have more pieces to hang this answer, basically. Sure, thank you. Yeah, uh, Simone, my question was, uh, others are using MVP or MVE in the case of uh, enter, uh, ecosystems. Do you do multiple uh, options that you then validate or do you go sequentially? Well, uh, normally, um, so normally this, this gives you an overview. So you, here you're not yet ready to go to MVP anything, but at the end of the next session, we're gonna talk about in a minute when you end up with experiences, uh, normally you have many, and I'm gonna spend a couple of words on, on, on this, if you don't mind, in a minute. So if, you, if I forgot, please remind me, but... Uh, so, this phase deals with uh, understanding your ecosystem, scanning the currently available experiences through these three layers, niche elements, aggregators, existing aggregators, mediators, brokers, uh, facilitators. So for example, I don't know, uh, uh, a search engine can be a mediator, uh, you can have an agency, a governmental agency to be a mediator, whatever. And you can even have an existing platform to be a mediator, an aggregator, and all the infrastructural elements, the resources, and so on. Then you build this abstraction of the value chain, you apply the recurring set of strategic plays, and you try to envision the transformative value chain. You're kind of getting excited about what you're going to bring to the market. You know, it's like, you know, I'm going to transform the value chain this way, and this is going to create massive advantages for this or the player, I'm gonna you know, address this problem or this other problem. You know, again, this is not easy, not gonna be a walk in the park, especially world lay mapping is a very hard, well, I mean, let me say it's not hard. It's, it's uh, um, it, needs, it needs your brain <laughs> at work. Uh, and, and, and there's not, a, uh, it's not a, uh, you know, there's not a level of goodness that you have to achieve. Everything you do is good. Anything you do at that level, understanding strategically the problem is good. You know, it gives you more insights to build upon before moving into the design. Not everybody that we work with or that work with our tools does this work of exploration because you can even jump into the strategy design uh, from the very first uh, moment. And in, in fact, the PDT was created without the exploration framework. And in the guide, in the PDT guide, you will find some notes, for example, saying, if you didn't do the exploration, maybe you want to do this, or if you, if you did the exploration, maybe you can jump this moment. So it's not, a, it's not that if you don't do that, you're not gonna work, uh, but if you do it, it's gonna be much more uh, informative uh, for you as a team. Then from now on, it's gonna be a bit faster. Strategy design, uh, the strategy design phase is about uh, uh, understanding clearly how you are reducing transaction costs, uh, how you create these learning engines. Uh, it's about getting ready to validate and it's about uh, uh, assessing your preliminary growth possibilities, growth patterns. And this, the characteristics of this strategy design phase is, is much more convergent. So it's, you don't diverge much. You, you start to actually converge into what you bring to the market. And uh, again, the, the, the mechanics are similar. So it's uh, still a small team, 20 hours roughly. Uh, it needs domain expertise. And in terms of organizational leadership, uh, you may have to, to make some prioritization of experiences. For example, what Alex said, this is part of normally this phase, choosing where to start from, uh, normally following a reflection on, for example, how you can plug things on top of each other in terms of growth loops. I'm gonna spend maybe a word in a moment. Uh, this is much more uh, familiar probably with most of you. Uh, it starts with what we call uh, the entity portraying. 
So uh, why there is no ecosystem canvas for those that are familiar to, to the PDT? Because normally, if you remember well, at the end of the ecosystem uh, scanning phase, you have already the, you have identified more or less the entities that you want to design for. Then for these entities, you actually start thinking of their context. You start to make a picture of their context. You, you ask questions like, you know, if I'm a solution provider, for example, what are my assets? What are my tools? What are my capabilities? What is my the pre, what are the performance pressure I'm going through? What are the goals? Uh, so this is how you contextualize the user, right? It's uh, similar to what normally you would see in a value chain camp, value proposition canvas, an empathy map. But it's a way that we created uh, that is much more conducive to platform thinking, and especially important to say that. We do this work on understanding what we call the access and reach gains uh, that highlight the niche expectations of the users. Do, doing platform business is always about enabling this nicheness. It's always about helping these players to express their uniqueness on the producer side and fulfill the unique needs on the consumer side. So these are questions you need to ask. You need to ask about what are the, the categories that I'm enabling? How do they find each other? What are the geographical constraints, for example? Are there cultural niches? What are the tribes that exist into here? So if I am looking for, um, I don't know, uh, for example, uh, you know, training. I don't wanna train, maybe, I'm not okay of training at any moment in the day because I have an agenda. So I want to train maybe when I'm free. And this makes it a niche need. I need a training session overnight or maybe early in the morning or maybe at lunchtime and so on, okay? Similarly, if I need a plumber, I do not need a plumber in New York because I'm in Rome. So there's a clear geographical niche in that case. So these are the things you have to understand. Uh, then you move into the transactional elements. So with the motivations matrix and the transactions board, you do an analysis of the transactions as, again, as they are happening, but here you start envisioning your ideas, right? How do you do that? You start to think about uh, how do you improve the channels for the existing transactions, but also how do you complement existing transactions with more steps that maybe do not exist at the moment or are scarcely organized at the moment. So you start to drop some ideas on how you complement what is existing in the ecosystem in terms of step, step transactions. So as you can see here, here we are talking about transactions in the context of the solar energy example. We're talking about, I don't know, for example, requesting a quote or uh, accepting a quote or paying the fees or uh, reviewing the installer or installing the materials. These are steps, right? In our experience as well, let me just say that motivations matrix, which is a bit more divergent and it's, it's really about uh, before stepping into the transactional element, you normally do value flow analysis. If you did the ecosystem scan, probably you don't need that. Right, because you already mapped the experiences. So maybe it's an alternative, right? If you don't do the, the scanning ecosystem analysis work that I've just introduced, maybe you want to do the motivation matrix better. If instead, if you did the ecosystem scan, maybe you can just jump into the transactional elements and start to analyze transactions uh, as they are step by step. Uh, then again, I encourage you to look into the manual. Uh, I mean, this is not the business model canvas, which is self-explanatory, much more powerful if you want, uh, because it's so simple. And unfortunately, doing platform business is much more complex. Designing for ecosystems needs more work. So I cannot go into the details at the moment, uh, but there is the guide for the details. So what follows uh, after the transactional elements, the design of the transactions engine, you move into learning engine. Learning engine is much intuitive. It's really about taking your uh, roles that you have identified and starting to think about how do they progress to, through the ecosystem, through the platform. Here, you really start to think about what can I bring? 
you start to really think in terms of what is this platform bringing to the people, to the participants of the ecosystem. So to answer original questions from Marina, this is where you start just dropping your ideas, but you, you do it not just starting by, you know, I have this idea. You, you, you do it by ch checking what are the challenges that the entities are living and what are the services that you can provide to them to overcome these challenges in a, in a, in a, in a process of getting better, first onboarding, then they getting better and then transcending the original idea, the original uh, opportunity that they, that they uh, sign for into new opportunities. So these three steps, onboarding, getting better, catching the new opportunity is a good heuristic to look at uh, your ecosystem, your platform strategy and saying, how am I supporting these participants to improve continuously, to essentially face the enormous challenges that everybody's living through as the world changes. So this is essentially the learning engine. Then finally, you put everything together. You take the transactions in the transaction board as Lego bricks. Then you take your learning services and potentially you complement with more elements and you try to design what uh, we call the experience, the platform experience, right? Uh, it's a bit small here, uh, sorry, but you should be able to see that. The platform experience is a mix of a kind of uh, customer journey, ecosystem journey, and a business model, right? So at the end of these sessions, right? At the end of this design process, you end up with a clear idea that uh, you are reducing transaction costs in a certain way. Your experience is reducing transaction costs in a certain way. You have created a system of learning for them to improve. And then you have a synthetic platform experience <coughs> that you can validate in the market. So coming back to before, you know, essentially as a, as a, as a um, uh, coming, coming back to the questions I received, first of all, the question on uh, uh, from Alex on you know the multiplicity of options that you have. So normally at the end of these sessions, you will have multiple platform experiences because you will have trying to design the core experiences that uh, emerge as essential as uh, initial starting point, right? Or at least uh, you are going to design uh, the experiences that are needed to uh, you know, have something that makes sense. So you can launch, for example, on the market, a platform for this solar energy thing that uh, models only the uh, selection, purchasing and payment, for example, right? So it's part of the experience, but then you can model maybe another experience, the models, the actual installation. So you can model maybe other types of services and so on. So. At the end of the day, you will end up with several experiences that normally connect. You know, for example, if you have a three uh, players uh, ecosystem, three players uh, marketplace, you cannot build uh, an experience that, you know, it's very hard to build an experience that connects the three of them. Because when you have marketplaces, it's always two sided, more or less, right? You say it's multi sided, but if you think about uh, Airbnb, for example, right? So you have the host and the guest. First experience that connects the host and the guest is booking a room. Then you have the experience host and the guest. And there is another experience that is about booking an experience. Then you have maybe the co-host and the host. And there is another experience that is about hiring a co-host, right? If you're familiar with Airbnb, you will know what a co-host is essentially someone that can host for you because you are busy in a few words. So these already are three experiences. So you may say, maybe to launch Airbnb, I need the three of them, or maybe not. Maybe you just need one, and then you will add them in the future. When, when it's important to add them in the future, especially if you have to reach liquidity, right? For example, think about the experience connecting the host and the guest. That needs liquidity. You need to build a liquid marketplace of host and guest. Then let's say that the, the experience that connects the experience host and the guest, that also needs liquidity. And these two are not connected in terms of liquidity, no, right? So you, 
it's going to be very hard for you to launch the two of them at the same time and be the liquid marketplace for both these experiences. And indeed, Airbnb didn't launch them together. Airbnb launched them much later. And another consideration you can take is that once you have launched the one, host the guest booking a room, and that's liquid, then you have a big host, uh, sorry, a big guest uh, uh, community to which you can throw another experience on. And it will be much easier for you to attract experience hosts because there is so many guests already than doing it from scratch, right? So point here is you can design as many experiences as you want, but as long as they need different liquid marketplaces, you may want to postpone one to another and start from one. Uh, and But essentially, uh, you know, you have to figure out what is the MVP that you want to bring to the market, the basic one. What else? Uh, the question that uh, I don't remember who was asking because it wasn't in video, but uh, the question of when do you bring the engineers in? One would be tempted to say, here, I give this experience, right? It's at the end of the day, it's a mix of a customer journey. So maybe they can figure out how to build it in software. But the answer is not yet, because first of all, you have to validate these assumptions, right? So you don't want to hand something to an engineer and tell them you have six months to build it, because otherwise they're going to build something that is very expensive and you didn't validate yet. Instead, you want to move into validation. So what does it mean to move into validation? It means that you have to identify in the experiences that you have designed, which again, it's a kind of a customer journey plus business model. So it's full of assumptions, both on the value perception, the experience itself, how the experience improves existing alternative solutions, assumptions on the business model, somebody's gonna pay for that and so on. You have to identify these risk assumptions and then build an MVP that validates this business assumption or simply at least build the uh, uh, run interviews or at least build a business experiment, not even an MVP, right? Build something that validates these assumptions. Once these assumptions are validated and you know, essentially here you need experimentation, iterative work, you know, for example, make a fake app on, on, the, Apple, on the Apple store or on the Android store, whatever, or, uh, you know, run an experience that is uh, not, you know, it's manually made, you remember, right? You know, do things that don't scale, do things manually, test things, validate assumptions. Once you have done this, uh, once you have validated the, the risk assumptions, then maybe you can get back to the experience, integrate the insights from the validation phase, and then hand over this to the engineer. Maybe before handing over this to the engineer, I would hand it over to an actual service designer or a UX designer so that they can design something that is much more complete than a platform experience. So some customer journey, blueprints, and so on. And then, give them to the engineer, right? So the important thing is you don't hand over something to an engineer for six months to work on if you didn't went through, if you didn't go through validation. If you didn't uh, confirm your risk assumptions, because if you give something to an engineer and then it turns out that people won't, gonna, won't pay for that, then it's gonna be a, a huge loss of money. How do you validate? Again, MVPs, experiments, they, that's not, you know, validation is a word, right? It's just, you know, you can run 10 masterclasses on validation, but at least if you look at the website where I've linked to, we have linked to these resources, you have a script guideline that helps you run interviews to your users that essentially are going to validate your assumptions on how the ecosystem work, and how the experience that you have designed resonates with this ecosystem. 
this is the basics of customer development, right? Customer development investigates two things, the nature of the problem and the contribution of the solution separately. So normally you don't do it all at once. You do it in two phases because you don't want to bias your, your interviewee. But at least if you don't want to do the MVP or the business experiments, just run interviews. Because I have been dealing with so many people doing large complex problems, projects without even running interviews with customers. That's really a pity, right? So many, so much energy. Why? Because sometimes we are afraid to actually get in and talk to the people, right? And here, some of you, I know you have been running very huge uh, validation phases, which is a very good idea to do so. So spend money on validation. Don't spend money on engineering until you didn't do validation. And validation is a massive learning opportunity. So much value in that. Finally, and then, you know, I'm gonna open for questions, growth. Once you have validated the MVP, you have something on the market, then you have to grow. You have to make growth hacking happen, right? And growth is about reaching liquidity, so it's about solving this chicken egg problem. So that's the first, uh, that's the first part, right? Then after you have validated the, the liquidity and so uh, and essentially addressed the chicken egg problem, you have to identify how do you invest your money or energy to sustain growth. I'm gonna go in, in a deeper uh, deeper details in a moment. And then, of course, another element of this phase is normally about pricing. Experimenting with pricing options. It's a very... Sorry, there is a... Okay. So it's a very practical phase. It's very iterative work. It's very challenging professionally growth. It generates huge expertise. It creates a lot of, uh, you know, basically it's one of the most enriching things that your team can do together with validation. So design and exploration, they are nice, they are fine. It's great to do canvases, but validation and growth is where your team is gonna grow. It's where you are going to really achieve improvements in terms of your understanding of the problem, the customer, the solutions you are building, right? So. That's very crucial. And what, how you enable this in an organization? You have to make room for skin in the game. So people that are involved in validation and growth, they need to be entrepreneurial. You cannot tell uh, you know, an employee, do validation and growth. I mean, you can, but it's not gonna happen. You know, people need to have skin in the game, right? They need to, be, uh, to feel like putting 110% of themselves into really discovering how you can create a new value in the market. That's something that is really for entrepreneurs. So if your company is not entrepreneurial, hack it, try to weigh, make it in a way that people will get some equity of the potential company you're building or some uh, you know, more salary or bonuses, whatever, you know? because this is gonna take so much energy out of them. And, and you want them to be stick with you because they're gonna create so much assets, so many assets, so much value in their brains after this, uh, that you wanna, you want them to stay with you, you know, in the long term. Just a moment, Alex, I'm gonna get to you at the end, if you don't mind at the end of this. So just to let you know a bit more, what are we talking about? Uh, in gro with growth, we're talking about flywheels, understanding the basics of how your, uh, your product builds defensibility and advantages. And this is, again, uh, available on a website. You can find it. And secondly, how you get, how your network effects work. So how do you reach liquidity? Is the relationship asymmetric or symmetric? The frequency of transactions? Uh, is this monogamous or polygamous? Meaning, you know, producers and consumers, how are they related? Is it, you know, the suppliers, are they felt as a commodity? So that at some point growth will, you know, kind of plummet because you know it doesn't make sense to add more providers, and so so these are the things you're gonna discover in the growth phase. And finally, 
you're going to discover how do you grow faster. Uh, for example, uh, investing money into building content or investing money into a sales force or investing money into web marketing, customer acquisition. You are, you're going to discover your unit economics. So how much money do I spend? How much value do I get from a customer? So these are the things that normally you figure out in the growth, uh, in the growth uh, phase. Alex? Uh, here I am. Uh, question, you, you said uh, here uh, you're going to price it um, in terms of pricing insights. I typically would do uh, in the validation phase uh, a willingness to pay. Right. Uh, is it both that you do or do you really do it so late? No, no, of course. I mean, uh, of course you do. Uh, pricing, it can be one of the um, uh, riskiest assumptions. Right, especially if you are into the business space, because normally consumers uh, have a much bigger price elasticity, right? So people don't care if they are booking on Airbnb and they spend 50 or 80 euros normally. But instead, if they are buying a service for the company, they, they care even one euro more or, or two euro more. So especially in that space, pricing is essential. Also pricing. You can play with pricing in the growth in the growth phase because you have to approach pricing strategically. Because sometimes maybe you want to generate liquidity and then you can play with pricing. Sometimes you want to generate broader inventory and then again you can play with pricing. Maybe you can discount some specific elements. So pricing, especially at the start, it needs to be taken strategically, right? But yes, pricing needs to be if, especially if it's a risk as assumption. You have to validate it first, but then you know pricing changes, right? Airbnb has changed pricing so many times, even changed not the level of pricing, but who is paying the price. So play with pricing in, in the growth in the growth phase. Okay, so that that was the presentation. It was much longer than expected. Uh, sorry about that, but still we have twenty minutes or so for questions. If there are uh, any, uh, I have just a couple of more slides at the end to to share with you in terms of pointers. But I'm happy to take some questions first, and and then and then uh, uh, before moving on. Perfect. I think George, George, you have a question. You raise your hand. No. Come on, more questions. Catherine. Uh, Simona, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. If I may ask you uh, whether you can detail more the intermediary phase with the UX designer before getting to the engineers, please. Right. I mean, uh, of course, the methodology here is a strategic design methodology, right? So uh, we are talking about business models, experiences, identifying the risk as assumptions, growth dynamics. We know, uh, you know, PDT doesn't design the actual details of the experience, right? So if you have an experience, platform experience canvas, fill it up. Normally, what do you have? You have these two pieces, right? You have a pieces where you essentially connect together a transactional moment, peer-to-peer -peer exchange, and a service that you provide so that it's facilitated. So for example, you can say an Airbnb. First, somebody signs up, then they receive a photographer proposal for good picture of the house. Then they receive the photographer at home. The photographer takes picture. Uh, they get published. Somebody books the house. There is a payment. And then there is a, a kind of... Uh, uh, um, the money for the photographer is taken out. So, so you have a, you design an experience that is roughly what is going to happen, but you don't go deep into the user experience uh, design because this is not a user experience, not even a service design tool. Service design and user experience are a very, uh, I would say, very solid uh, body of work that you, you still want to engage with uh, before giving this to the engineers that need to actually implement the software, right? So that's normally what happens. After you do the validation, your MVP works, you have validated your assumptions, you are ready to build something more solid from a software perspective. 
you know, don't give the platform experience. So <laughs> don't give the platform experience canvas to the to the to the engineer because it's too broad, right? They can interpret too much. Uh, do some proper UX design, user experience design, and then you go for for the software implementation, right? Now I must say, you know, now there is so much no code, low code options that you have that this is a bit more fuzzy. So sometimes you can just evolve an MVP into a proper product. It's good. I mean, as soon as you do it, as long as you do it entrepreneurially, as long as you do it with some good taste, you can generate good engagement with your customers. But the, 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 the question is validate first, uh, you know, up, improve a bit of the experience then engineer the product. You know, engineering is a problem for the long term. It's not really a problem for the short term of understanding where the value is. Good, I think Sabrina. Yes, hi, um, sorry that I have a little bit of a cold. Um, so I have this question around product market fit or platform market fit in terms of you have already validated the different assumptions and you start with the MVP. And my, my question here is, what type of norm metrics do you kind of recommend to follow? Uh, I, lost I actually have the liquidity that I want and then I am ready to begin the growth stage. Any kind of, a, um, uh, yeah, kind of advice, not drowning in different metrics in KPA, K KPIs to yes, kind of I click on the part of market? I was trying to open uh, <coughs> just a second, so maybe I can show you something, but yeah. <clears throat> well, in general, I, I think my, my, you know, our impression from the research we have been running on growth is that uh, uh, there are these three, uh, three main elements when it comes to matrix, sorry, to metrics. One is, I, uh, did I reach liquidity? I'm delivering the right engagement to the, to the participants. One is, do they stay reta retained in the platform? And finally, how are my economics working, right? So these are the three main macro types. And of course, these are the first, right? Because liquidity is such essential element of your value proposition in platforms. If a platform is not liquid, it doesn't deliver the value proposition. So let's say that at the MVP stage, you can validate just a subset of the value proposition on the platform, right? Mainly, for example, the, the single user value, or maybe you can uh, you know, try to validate some liquidity aspects very limited, but then you have to grow to really validate the whole value proposition, right? Because platforms are available when they grow, you know, the network effects, right? So first of all, reaching liquidity, then increasing retention, and then platform economics. There is uh, you know, a huge uh, post on our blog uh, where you can also find this, um, kind of schema here, where there is also a list of type of metrics you can use in each of these phases. So if you don't mind, I would prefer to, you know, send people to read the blog instead of just mentioning a few of them out of, out of memory here, uh, because, you know, we have been taking lots of existing work into these metrics like Brian Balfour and, and other, you know, great experts, Casey Winters and so on. So here you can find at least something that helps you figure out what are the three main aspects, what are the metrics that you can use each, and also each product is gonna have a particular subset of uh, metrics that you can use. And also combining those metrics into something more solid in terms of input and output metrics that you want to choose. So I would suggest to maybe read the blog. Uh, it's much more comprehensive than just approaching this in these short minutes, if you don't mind. But, <laughs> yeah, of course. But, uh, but uh, these three elements, I think they, they are the essential part, right? So we're talking about, first of all, liquidity metrics at the start, engagement and liquidity. So for example, a liquidity metric is time to fill, right? something like that, search to fill. Engagement, uh, it's important because for example, if I'm a producer, I don't wanna stay in a platform where, you know, I don't receive the right level of orders, for example, average order number. Uh, then retention and then, uh, you know, of course you can have a platform that works, it's liquid, it retains people, but if your 
unit economics do not work, it's a problem. If you can't sustain growth, so your cost per acquisition is too high and your lifetime value is too low. So simply there are some markets where it doesn't make sense to make a marketplace. You can just go to the shop, you know, on, in the round the corner. Okay, but will you suggest that depending on the platform, if you actually need to have uh, way more volume in terms of engagement and retention, that people are not willing to to start buying because you don't have? Imagine it's an advice. Uh, the monetization is going to be ads. You need to have critical mass, or not critical mass, but an engaged community or an engaged user base to even start to monetize. So in product market, we need first stage because before growing, maybe this platform economics just to test the willing of payment if that the scenario comes into, into place that actually mm -hmm. having people pay because people will not pay if, if you have just a really small kind of... Um, yeah. structure of users, that's, right? That, that was say, what I was saying, that mm. uh, uh, okay. in platforms or marketplaces, there is something you can validate at the MVP stage that is mainly yeah. the single user value part, for yeah. example, or maybe you can fake some liquidity, but mm. at the end of the day, some liquidity, uh, you, you can also, you can only attain liquidity and then validate that, for example, that mm. market is going to deliver that level of engagement yeah. that keeps them into the platform, right? This is something you yeah. cannot validate in IMVP. Yeah. Or at least you oh. can fake it, but since it depends on network effects. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's been hard, but the, yeah, kind of seeing like the trends, if it's actually, if, had, if it happens in a lower scale, then see if it makes sense in a, in yeah, a you larger can also scale. You can also <laughs> constrain, right? You can start from one category or one yeah. geography, but still, growth uh, will depend on such patterns replicating across categories and across geographies. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, thank you so much. I think it's time for Chloe. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a hopefully a quick question, which is about the stage of reimagining your, your value chain map. Um, where you come together as a group and, and you implement those those six, uh, what were they called? Um, platform plays. Platform plays. It seems to me that's the, the, the most impactful moment of, of the whole process in terms of transition, transformation. Do you encourage creativity with, with your, your team when you, when you go through this phase? Yes, uh, totally. Uh, but uh, exploration is really about them. It's really about the ecosystem, right? So mm. creativity, fine, of course, but uh, do not, you know, try to stay attached to the reality. Mm. Of course, I mean, uh, there are some marketplaces that are, have been reinventing some basically not existing, non-existing behaviors, right? But most of the value that platforms have delivered at the moment, um, it's really about uh, existing industries that are going through a reorganizing, right? So they are going through uh, passing from a, a fragmented experience into a scalable organized experiences. So this is the big opportunity, right? The big opportunity is there is big market that is uh, having a very fragmented experience. They hate doing what they do. I'm coming and making it much better. And yeah. this is Airbnb, right? Airbnb, you can make a poster of Airbnb of a terrible industry, very small, and now became huge and much better, right? Uh, so that's the kind of playbook that I would suggest. So stay, cool. stay true to the ecosystem at the start. That makes sense. And I've just thought of another one as you were, as you were speaking. Airbnb is obviously a great example. I wondered if you had a go-to B2B example that you like to refer to. Uh, well, Shopify is, is fairly yeah. important. It's fairly, yeah. I mean, it's a great company uh, doing a lot of Salesforce app exchange. is also a good example in B2B or mm -hmm. I don't know, there are plenty of uh, examples yes. uh, uh, in, in other spaces like, um, you know, in, for example, Craxi in commercial real estate or okay. others. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Shopify for me, it's like the, the best example together with Airbnb. If you want to learn how to do things, especially yeah. Shopify in, in terms of uh, developer engagement, third parties, extensions, 
uh, they're really setting the bar. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Cool, thank you. Daniel, go ahead. Thanks, Simone, that was really good. Um, I just had a question around, obviously, a lot of these, uh, the methodology is focused on unifying the, the firm with the market and the experiences and the strategies and the platforms that are designed are for the market. But for a team that is internal to the organization, so in my role, my customer is the general managers and the executive that are inside the organization. How have you seen, you've worked with a lot of people, a lot of teams, a lot of companies over the years. How have you seen these practices and the methodology in general applied um, when the customer is inside the organization and your ecosystem is, is internal to the, to the company? Um, so essentially, often you start from either uh, an education program. Uh, so for example, a boot camp, a private boot camp, where you train uh, kind of a leadership, uh, some kind of design leadership team, like you know, six, 10 people, and then they uh, start to use the methodology. But so many other times what we have seen is uh, um, uh, we've been running uh, one project through the methodology as an advisor. And then, would then you know, the quality of the outputs was so great that you know, basically they said, you know, this needs to be integrated into the methodologies that we use. So we normally move from one project into um, design leadership training. And then in some cases, we have been moving into um, large scale org wide uh, uh, kind of literacy building and uh, toolkits uh, integration, uh, large scale programs. So. I must say probably the best would be to convince someone to test in the methodology on one project with a good uh, sponsoring. And then from there, uh, normally it, it flows uh, to the rest of the organization. Thank you. Okay, so eight minutes. Um, I don't know who will do it first, George or Alex. <laughs> George, George, thank you. Uh, one more question with your permission, uh, Simone and everybody. How you reach in a very fast way liquidity and in a stable and safe way? I mean, uh, again, this is something we really uh, cover at the bootcamp. So I suggest if you are curious about that, uh, that uh, you join us. But essentially, in a few words, uh, constraining, it's normally one of the, it's the, the real first step. So constraining means that uh, you need to figure out what is normally called the, um, as you call them, um, well, uh, I like the words now, but basically the, the, uh, the, yeah, the canonical unit. What is the canonical unit is the overlap of categories. Like for example, when I say uh, on, uh, I need a plumber in New York, that's a category and a geography, right? So mixing these two, this is what you, you, you understand as where you need to be liquid. So some people that gets into the platform will need to find a plumber in New York and not a carpenter in New York or a plumber in Rome, right? So that's the first thing. And then normally you constrain when you launch in terms of geography or categories. So for example, launching a marketplace across Europe is gonna be too big. You maybe start from Paris, then you move into Berlin, and then you move into London, whatever. So city by city, it can be sometimes nationwide if they are not location dependent, or maybe you can launch a European wide, but category specific. So a marketplace for uh, even worldwide, but just for, I don't know. Um, Wines. Yes, right? So one category, even, I don't know, French wines or Italian wines, right? Uh, Romanian, Romanian one. Right, right, right. Um, so constraining at the start and then moving away, uh, moving out. Then you also need to figure out where, where do you want to focus first? Do you want to focus on the suppliers or demand? So you have to figure out where are you constrained? What is the most pressing thing? So normally you always, you know, 99% of the times you are supply constrained, right? Because um, 
demand is normally much more abundant, right? But there could be some cases where you are demand constrained uh, because uh, it requires a change of behavior. So if I always did something in a traditional way, and then I'm gonna do that on a marketplace, uh, that may require a particular focus at the launch phase to get the demand on board. So in that case, you have demand constraint. So these are two major things that you normally do to uh, identify where you wanna be liquid. And then reaching liquidity is about growth tactics, like single user value, for example, giving one participant uh, value, even if the, uh, if the system is not liquid yet, this will bring you, um, you know, participants on board, but there are tons, right? You know, in our training, we identify 10 growth tactics. It can be subsidizing, it can be scraping, it can be, I don't know, um, whatever, uh, marquee strategy, onboarding VIPs, right? There are 10 at least that you can use as growth tactics to reach liquidity, uh, to facilitate the reaching liquidity after you have identified the category constraints, the geography constraints, and so on. Another one is, for example, underutilized fixed assets. So these are some things that you can use to get uh, to liquidity. Thank you very much. And also this is at the training, but also on the blog post, right? So I'm not just saying, I'm not just here to sell trainings, but you can also go on the website and get everything on the blog post. Yeah, and I would have one more question, uh, Simone, the, the current reality out there in B2B versus B2C, how long does it on average typically take uh, till that is a viable uh, business proposition also financially these days? I mean, B2B, I think is much, my impression is, uh, my experience is that it's much easier. Right, because transactions are bigger in value, um, and uh, um, and it's easier uh, for someone that is expert uh, in the field to start. For example, you can start a marketplace out of a consulting business. So the MVP can be a sustainable business, right? So normally, when you have higher order value transactions. Uh, when you have much more frequent transactions, like in the business context, uh, it's easier to get liquid, you know, because it's more important for the customers and more important for the producers. It's work that they uh, uh, they really they really need to do. Uh, consumer marketplaces are, of course, much more challenging, right? Because they are big, they need lots of marketing money. Normally, they are related to growth models, for example, uh, related to uh, uh, web marketing. Uh, instead, the business context can be much easily about sales. So you can actually pay a sales force and get people on board. So business, B2B, it's a huge space, needs transformation. Maybe the, 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 you know, maybe the opportunities are a bit more smaller, but it's a great space to start, especially if you have B2B expertise, Basically, everybody doing work in B2B should be thinking about scaling up through marketplaces. Very That's good. It. So, I don't know. Anyone just, else? Just, uh, if, I, if I can use just, Marina, one minute, if you don't mind. Yes. Yes, just to course. remind everybody that, uh, that uh, well, of course, uh, we do advisory. Mm, we always in co-creation. We don't do consulting. We help you facilitation through facilitation. The licenses, are, as I said, we're talking about a commercial-friendly Creative Commons license. You can you can see on our website on the about space. There is a description how you can use our stuff. There is our uh, research. We do research. So if your company is curious about this space in a specific context, please reach out. Uh, consider sponsor our uh, our research. Uh, and attaching your brand to cutting edge content. At the moment, we are actively researching Web3 space, decentralization, uh, growth, validation. So, you know, we are here, reach out. Uh, We've been partnering with some world leading brands on research already. 
There is a white paper, November 2020, uh, released uh, that connects platform ecosystems thinking to what the hell is happening in the world, systems transition, ecological challenges, uh, social transformation, uh, risk uh, factors. So check this out. Podcasts and webinars. We have our podcasts running every two weeks on, on, on Tuesday. Coming up, we have um, uh, a, a fantastic episode on Tuesday next week where I will, Stina, I will do a recap of where we are. So it's a very informative piece. And then coming up, we have, for example, uh, Mara Zepeda, Zebras. Uh, uh, we have uh, Ethan Bookman from uh, Cosmos. So, so much things coming up. You can find uh, you know, Tim O'Reilly. There is a fantastic podcast with Gabe Luna Ostaseski from a couple of weeks ago where it speaks about marketplaces and Web3. Ensure you catch up with that because it's massive. And uh, these are some of our customers. These are my uh, contacts. So please uh, reach out. I'm always happy to engage. Okay, so thank you very much. And um, was a question here on the chat that if uh, you can share with us a presentation. And yes. um, what we are going to do is we have record this uh, session. We are going to include it on, on the network, on, on the crash course. So you will find all the recording, the presentation, the links that we have shared of the blogs and uh, also the PDT download and everything that we have talked today. And also you can contact directly to Simone also on the network and also through LinkedIn and all the the social networks because he's everywhere. <laughs> so, um, and also remember that we have a discount for networkers also to all these courses, all these trainings, all these certifications. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here with us and it has been a pleasure. And thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.